Hi, welcome back. Today we'll be studying Matthew chapter 9 and 10, Mark chapter 5, and Luke chapter 9 from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Institute Manual, and this corresponds with March 6th through 12th of 2023, even though I'm, it's uh, today March 25th, but I got behind, apologize about that try to catch up here. So Matthew chapter 9 says, Jesus healed a paralytic. A bedridden man plagued by some sort of paralysis was brought before Jesus by four of his friends. Jesus was moved by their faith, but rather than immediately healing the man, he spoke something infinitely more significant. Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Some Jewish leaders complained and criticized that such talk was blasphemous. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus was indeed God and was forgiving the man's sins. In various dispensations, the Lord has taught that great faith can bring forgiveness of one's sins. Forgiveness can also come through bearing fervent testimony of the Savior and dedicating oneself to preaching the gospel. To read more about the healing of this paralytic, see commentary from Mark 2, 2 through 5. So we read that last week. I want to read about how we receive forgiveness of our sins through our faith. It says, James chapter 5, 15, and it says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And then it references DNC 62, 3, which says, Nevertheless, ye are blessed, for the testimony which ye have borne is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon, and they rejoice over you, and your sins are forgiven you. And DNC 8461 says, For I will forgive you of your sins with this commandment, that you remain steadfast in your minds in solemnity and the spirit of prayer, and bearing testimony to all the world of those of those things which are communicated unto you. And uh, it talks about we receive forgiveness by preaching, in DNC 31.5, it says, Therefore, thrust in your sickle with all your soul, and your sins are forgiven you, and you shall be laden with sheaves upon your back, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, wherefore your family shall live. And also DNC 60, verse 7, And in this place let them lift up their voice and declare my word, with loud voices, without wrath or doubting, lifting up holy hands upon them, for I am able to make you holy, and your sins are forgiven you. The Calling of Matthew The term publicans, Latin publicani, refers to men who are responsible to the Roman government for overseeing the collection of taxes in Israel, as well as to those who worked for them and actually collected the revenue. Tax collectors were required to pay a fixed amount to the government each year, but they were free to collect as much from the public as they could. Thus, in Jesus' day, publicans were one of the most corrupt and detested groups of people among the Jewish populace. Jews who became publicans were often excommunicated. One of the Lord's original apostles, Matthew, also known as Levi before his conversion, was a publican. Matthew 9.9 highlights Matthew's readiness to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. At the simple invitation, follow me, Matthew left the receipt of custom, the tax office, and followed Jesus. Matthew hosted a feast attended by many of his fellow publicans, whom the Pharisees labeled as sinners. Jesus took the opportunity to teach a powerful lesson on pride in Luke chapter 5. Many of these other publicans also followed Jesus. Many of the publicans mentioned in the New Testament accepted the gospel, perhaps because they were humbled by their lowly social status. New Cloth and New Bottles The disciples of John came to the Savior and asked him why his disciples did not fast. Jesus answered by comparing himself to a bridegroom and his disciples to the bridegroom's friends. A marriage feast was a time of great rejoicing, like the time when the Savior was among his friends. Fasting in those days was normally associated with sorrow and would not be appropriate while he was with them. Soon he would not be with them, and then it would be a time of fasting. The bottles Jesus Christ referred to in Matthew 9.17 were containers made from goat skins, often called wine skins. 
not those made of glass or earthenware were commonly we commonly think of today. With time, wineskins became stretched, cracked, and brittle. Gases produced by the fermentation of newly made wine would expand and stretch old wineskins and could cause them to burst. The new cloth, mentioned in Matthew 9.16, refers to unshrunken cloth, which would have been undesirable as a patch because when it shrank, it would tear away from the surrounding fabric, the old cloth not being strong enough for the new. Both analogies, the new cloth, the new bottles, point to the incompatibility of the old with the new. In the context of the Savior's response to the Pharisees, the Savior seemed to be teaching that the gospel he offered was meant not merely to mend Judaism, but to replace many religious and cultural practices of his day. In the same way, the Savior came to make us not just better men and women, but new creatures. The Joseph Smith translation adds, For when that which is new is come, the old is already is ready to be put away. I'm going to read this about becoming a new creature because that's like the most important thing we can do. In Matthew, Mosiah 27, 26, it says, And thus they became new creatures, and unless they do this, they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. And Galatians 6, 15 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Okay, now, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. As the Savior taught in all the cities and villages in Galilee, multitudes gathered to hear him, and he perceived that there were many who would accept the gospel, but he declared, the laborers are few. More ministers of the gospel were needed. As recorded in the very next chapter, the twelve apostles were called given authority, and sent forth. Later, the Savior sent forth 70 more men to preach. President M. Russell Bellard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that in our day, the church also needs more laborers. He gave the following example of what can happen when church members become active, actively involved in sharing the gospel with friends and neighbors. Some years ago, a faithful convert, Brother George McLaughlin, was called to preside over a small branch of 20 members in Farmingdale, Maine. He was a humble man, driving a milk delivery truck for a living. Through his fasting and earnest prayer, the Spirit taught him what he and the members of his branch needed to do to help the church grow in their area. Through his great faith, constant prayer, and powerful example, he taught his members how to share the gospel. In a marvelous story, one of the great missionary stories of this dispensation, in just one year, there were 450 convert baptisms in the branch. The next year, there were an additional 200 converts. Just five years later, the Augusta Main Stake was organized. Much of the leadership of that new stake came from those converts in the Farmingdale branch. Now we might ask why there was such great success in those days, and the answer may be because of the urgent need to strengthen the church. Let me assure you that that same urgency in all units of the church is, is every bit as critical today as it was then. Let's see, we need to do Matthew chapter 10 also. It says, He gave them power and sent them forth. Matthew 10 records the calling of the twelve apostles and the Lord's instructions to them. The word apostle means one sent forth. The title also implies that the person sent forth has authority and a message to proclaim. In these latter days, the Lord has declared that apostles are sent forth to be special witnesses of the name of Christ in all the world. Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that modern apostles have the same assignment as apostles in New Testament times. An apostle today continues to be one sent forth. The conditions we face are different from those of the early brethren as we make our journeys to fulfill our assignment. Our manner of travel to all corners of the earth is very different from that of the early brethren. However, our assignment remains the same as that which was given by the Savior as he instructed his called twelve to go ye therefore and teach all nations. 
after declaring that Latter-day Apostles are men who have a witness of the Lord's divinity and whose voices have been and will be raised in testimony of his reality. President Gordon B. Hinckley further described the work of the Apostles. Their one chief concern must be the advancement of the work of God on the earth. They must be concerned with the welfare of our Father's children, both those within the church and those out of the church. They must do all that they can to give comfort to those who mourn, to give strength to those who are weak, to give encouragement to those who falter, to befriend the friendless, to nurture the destitute, to bless the sick, to bear witness, not out of belief, but out of certain knowledge of the Son of God, their friend and master, whose servants they are. The Twelve Apostles. The following chart provides a brief overview of the Savior's original Twelve Apostles. Simon, his other names were Peter, Cephas, Simeon, brother of Andrew. He lived in Bethsaida and Capernaum. He was a fisherman with Andrew and and Zebedee's family, senior apostle following Savior's death, missionary as far as Rome. Tradition says he was crucified head downward in Rome about AD 64 to 68. With James and John, he conferred the Melchizedek priesthood on Joseph Smith. Andrew, brother of Peter, he lived in Bethsaida and Capernaum, fisherman with Peter and Zebedee's family, first introduced Peter to Jesus. Tradition says he preached in Scythia, Ukraine and Russia, Greece and Asia Minor, and was crucified on an X-shaped cross. James, other names are son of Zebedee. He and his brother John were Boinigers, or sons of thunder. Uh, he is from possibly Bethsaida. He was a fisherman with John, Peter, and Andrew. He preached in Jerusalem and Judea. He was the member of the first presidency with Peter and John and he was beheaded by Herod in AD 44 in Jerusalem, first of the twelve to be martyred. John, the beloved, he and his brother James were Boinagers, of, or Sons of Thunder. Um, he was also possibly from Bethsaida. He was a fisherman with James, Peter, and Andrew, member of the First Presidency with Peter and James, labored among churches of Asia Minor, especially Ephesus, banished to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation, was later translated. Philip didn't have any other names. He's from Bethsaida, shared news with of the long-awaited Messiah with Nathaniel. Tradition says he preached in Asia Minor and died in Heriopolis. Bartholomew, his other names are Nathaniel, or a different spelling of Nathaniel, He's from Cana. Tradition says he preached in southern Arabia and was flayed to death or crucified. Matthew, his other names are Levi or the son of Alphaeus. He's from Capernaum. He's a tax collector. Tradition says he preached in Parthia and Ethiopia where he died as a martyr. Thomas, his other name is Didymus, probably from Galilee. His tradition says he was a missionary in Parthia or Roman Iran and modern Iran and India and died when shot by arrows while in prayer. James, his other name was the less, the younger or son of Alpheus, probably from Galilee. Tradition says he preached in Palestine and Egypt and was crucified in Egypt or stoned by Jews for preaching of Jesus. Simon, his other name is the Canaanite or the Zealot, probably from Galilee, may have taught the gospel in Britain and Egypt. Tradition says he suffered death by crucifixion. Judas, son of James, Jude, Theodos, and Lebius are his other names, probably from Galilee. Tradition says he preached in Assyria and Persia where he was martyred. And the last one is Judas Iscariot. His other name is Iscariot from Kerioth or Judea, betrayed Jesus Christ, and then hanged himself. Not Go not to the Gentiles, but to the house of Israel. The Savior's instruction in these verses shows that in his time, 
The preaching of the kingdom of God was to the Jew first and later to the Gentiles. After the Savior's resurrection, he instructed his apostles to take the gospel message to all nations, both Jews and Gentiles. To read more about the tension between Jews and Samaritans at the time of Christ, see the commentary for John 4. So let's read Romans 1.16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then the next one was Matthew fifteen twenty four, which says, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then when he takes the gospel to the Gentiles, it says to read Acts 1, 8, and it says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the ut uttermost part of the earth. It says, without purse or scrip. In the Savior's time, a purse carried money while a scrip was a larger bag used to carry food or other supplies. The Savior instructed his apostles that they would not, they were not to worry about food, clothing, lodging, or other temporal needs. They were to rely on the Lord and the mercies of others for their sustenance. This was in harmony with the hospitality and social customs of the day. Later, in Luke 22:35-36, Jesus revoked this command to rely on the hospitality of the people perhaps because the apostles would soon carry the gospel to Gentile nations that did not have the same standards of hospitality and because they would face opposition from the Jews as they went out into the world. Shake off the dust of your feet. Elder James E. Talmadge provided this insight about the Savior's instructions regarding shaking off the dust of one's feet. Quote, to ceremonially shake the dust from one's feet as a testimony against another was understood by the Jews to symbolize a cessation of fellowship and a renunciation of all responsibility for consequences that might follow. It became an ordinance of accusation and testimony by the Lord's instructions to his apostles as cited in Matthew 10:14. In the current dispensation, the Lord has similarly directed his authorized servants to so testify against those who willfully and maliciously oppose the truth when authorized, when authoritatively presented. Because of its serious nature, however, this should never be done except under the direction of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. In DNC 2415, it says, and in whatsoever place ye shall enter, and they receive you not in my name, ye shall leave a cursing instead of a blessing, by casting off the dust of your feet against them as a testimony, and cleansing your feet by the wayside. Matthew 10:16. Wise as serpents, when the Savior sent his disciples out to preach the gospel, he told them to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In modern times, the Savior gave similar counsel to his disciples, declaring, Be ye as wise as serpents, and yet without sin. Both accounts teach that the Savior's disciples should combine wisdom with innocence and purity. The Joseph Smith translation emphasizes the importance of being a wise servant of the Master. Be ye therefore wise servants, and as harmless as doves. He that loveth father or mother more than me. In these verses, Jesus Christ declared that his message would not always bring peace. In fact, choosing to make God preeminent in one's life might even result in divisions within a family. President Ezra Taft Benson, in comment commenting on the scripture, noted that one of the most difficult choices a person might make is choosing between God and a family member. Quote, one of the most difficult tests of all is when you have to choose between pleasing God or pleasing someone you love or respect, particularly a family member. Nephi faced that test and handled it well when his good father temporarily murmured against the Lord. Job maintained his integrity with the Lord even though his wife told him to curse God and die. The scriptures say, Honor thy father and thy mother. Sometimes one must choose to honor Heavenly Father over a mortal father. 
He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency taught that losing our lives means overcoming selfishness and committing ourselves to the service of others. For each of us, unselfishness can mean being the right person at the right time in the right place to render service. Almost every day brings opportunities to perform unselfish acts for others. Such acts are unlimited and can be as simple as a kind word, a helping hand, or a gracious smile. The Savior reminds us, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. One of life's paradoxes is that a person who approaches everything with a what's-in-it-for-me attitude may acquire money, property, and land, but in the end will lose the fulfillment and the happiness that a person enjoys who shares his talents and gifts generously with others. The greatest fulfillment in life comes by rendering service to others and not being obsessed with what's in it for me. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that losing our lives means submitting our will to God's will, thereby finding our true identity. So many of us are kept from eventual consecration because we mistakenly think that somehow, by letting our will be swallowed up in the will of God, we lose our individuality. What we are really worried about, of course, is not giving up self, but selfish things, like our roles, our time, our preeminence, and our possessions. No wonder we are instructed by the Savior to lose ourselves. He is only asking us to lose the old self in order to find the new self. It is not a question of one's losing identity, but of finding his true identity. For additional insights on what it means to lose your life for the Lord's sake, see the commentaries on Mark 8. I think we read that last week, Mark 8. No, that's in the future. Uh, receiving a prophet in the name of a prophet. To receive a prophet in the name of a prophet means to accept him as a prophet and to recognize his words as coming from the prophet. President M. Russell Ballard shared an example of a young woman who showed by her actions that she received President Gordon B. Hinckley as a prophet. President Ballard referred to counsel that President Hinckley had given to youth of the church concerning their physical appearance, including admonishing young women to wear only one pair of earrings. He said, I know a 6-17-year-old who, just prior to the prophet's talk, had pierced her ears a second time. She came home from the fireside, took off the second set of earrings and simply said to her parents, If President Hinckley says we should only wear one set of earrings, that's good enough for me. Wearing two pair of earrings may or may not have eternal consequences for this young woman. But her willingness to obey the prophet will, and if she will obey him now on something relatively simple, how much easier it will be to follow him when greater issues are at stake. Whew. Okay, we made it through the Matthew chapters. Now we're going into Mark chapter 5. That's it, just Mark chapter 5, and then we'll do Luke chapter 9. Oh, I need to read Mark chapter 4 too, because it's just, uh, it's just a couple paragraphs, but I forgot to do that in the last video. This is parables. For information on why Jesus Christ taught using parables, as well as insights on the parables of the sower or the soils and the parable parable of the mustard seed, see Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the seed growing by itself. This parable of the seed growing by itself, found only in the Gospel of Mark, teaches about the partnership between God and man. The man plants seeds in an environment where growth can occur, but then he must wait for the growth to happen. As time passes, the earth that God created gradually brings forth fruit of herself. As Paul wrote, men may plant and water, but it is God who miraculously giveth the increase. Only God can make things grow. This principle applies to spiritual growth in individuals and to the growth of the church throughout the world. While serving as an Area 70 elder, Wilfred R. Lopez discussed this parable and its application to our lives. Quote, an important lesson of this parable is for those of us who are teachers, whether in the home or church classroom, or who are involved in missionary work, the germination and full flowering of living gospel seeds in the hearts and minds of those we teach depend on factors over which we may have little control. The choice of whether a person will ponder and accept the truths of the gospel belongs as a matter of personal agency 
with those we teach. If a person's testimony is to grow until it bears mature fruit or conversion, God must be the primary force behind our harvest. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we may participate in the education of those who are growing and becoming fruitful. We, as authorized sowers, need to understand and trust that the restored gospel of Jesus Christ is a living seed and that if we will teach it, the grace of God will attend those we teach as they grow to spiritual maturity and bring forth good works. Our joy will then be full in the day of the harvest. Jesus Christ calmed the storm. The Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake in northern Israel, or northeastern Israel. It is located in the Jordan Rift Valley at nearly 700 feet below sea level and is surrounded by high mountains on the west, north, and east. Winds can whip down the western slopes and create sudden intense storms with formidable waves on this relatively small body of water. Fishermen in the middle of the lake can be frightened for their lives. On the occasion Mark described, Jesus slept calmly while the tempest raged until his friends, who were full of fear, awakened him. President Howard W. Hunter discussed some important truths in Mark's account of the Savior's calming of a storm in Galilee. All of us have seen some sudden storms in our lives. A few of them, though temporary, like these on the Sea of Galilee, can be violent and frightening and potentially destructive. As individuals, as families, as communities, as nations, even as a church, we have had sudden squalls arise which have made us ask one way or another, Master, carest thou not that we perish? In one way or another, we always hear in the stillness after the storm, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Make this a little bit bigger again. None of us would like to think we have no faith, but I suppose the Lord's gentle rebuke here is largely deserved. This great Jehovah, in whom we say we trust, and whose name we have taken upon us, is he who said, Let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let us divide the waters from the waters. And he is also the one who said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. Furthermore, it was he who parted the Red Sea, allowing the Israelites to pass through on dry ground. Certainly, it should be no surprise that he could command a few elements acting up on the Sea of Galilee, and our faith should remain, remind us that he can calm the troubled waters of our lives. But Jesus was not spared grief and pain and anguish and buffeting. His ship was tossed most of his life, and, at least to mortal eyes, it crashed fatally on the rocky coast of Calvary. We are asked not to look on life with mortal eyes. With spiritual vision, we know something quite different was happening upon the cross. Peace was on the lips and in the heart of the Savior, no matter how fiercely the tempest was raging. May it so be with us, in our own hearts, in our own homes, in our nations of the world, and even in the buffetings faced from time to time by the church. We should not expect to get through life individually or collectively without some opposition. And then we'll do Mark chapter 5. It says chapters 5 through 7 of Mark's gospel, advanced themes that were introduced in Mark 1 through 4. Mark's accounts of the Savior's miracles reveal the Savior's great compassion and teach eternal truths about the plan of salvation. The opposition toward the Savior intensified with the death of John the Baptist at the hands of Herod Antipas, an event that foreshadowed the Savior's own impending suffering and death, as well as the future martyrdom of many of his disciples. As some Pharisees continued to find fault with Jesus Christ and his disciples, the Savior reproved them for placing their traditions above the commandments of God. Okay, Mark 5-7, through seven, the Savior's miracles teach eternal truths. The miracles discussed here give important insights into the truths of the Savior taught. Miracles were an important element in the work of Jesus Christ, being not only divine acts, but forming also a part of the divine teaching. They were intended to be a proof to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Many of them were also symbolic, teaching such divine truths as the result of sin and the cure of sin, the value of faith, the curse of impurity, 
and the law of love. Thus, a profitable way to study the Savior's miracles is to remember that each miracle points to something larger than the event itself, and to look for specific truths about God and his work that the miracle affirms. Jesus Christ cast out devils and allowed them to enter a herd of swine. Though Mark and Luke identified the location of this miracle as Gadara, and Matthew identified it as Jerjissa, it is clear that the miracle took place on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, which was inhabited by the Gentiles. This explains the presence of swine herding in the area. Gentiles could eat pork, but Jews could not, for eating pork was forbidden by the law of Moses. The possessed man called himself Legion, a word that in New Testament times referred to a division in the Roman army usually composed of 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. Mark and Luke clarify that the name Legion meant that the man was possessed by many evil spirits. After Jesus cast out the devils, they asked him to be allowed to enter a herd of swine. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles identified several truths that we learn from this miracle. This particular instance of an ejecting spirit beings from a stolen tenement is set forth in detail by the gospel writers to show... One, that evil spirits acting actual beings from Lucifer's realm gain literal entrance into mortal bodies. Two, that they then have such power over those bodies as to control the physical acts performed. Three, that persons possessed by evil spirits are subject to the severest mental and physical sufferings and to the basest sort of degradation, all symbolical of the eternal torment to be imposed upon those who fall under Satan's control in the world to come. Four, that devils remember Jesus from pre-existence. Five, that the desire to gain bodies is so great among Lucifer's minions as to cause them not only to steal the mortal tabernacles of men, but to enter the bodies of animals. Six, that the devils know their eventual destiny is to be cast out into an eternal hell from whence there is no return, 7. That rebellious and worldly people are not converted to the truth by observing miracles. And 8. That those cleansed from evil spirits can then be used on the Lord's errand to testify of his grace and goodness so that receptive persons may be led to believe in him. Go home to tell thy friends and tell them. In many instances, the Savior commanded a person whom he had healed not to spread news of the miracle. After casting out the legion of devils, the Savior did just the opposite and told the man, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. Perhaps this was because the miracle occurred in the Gentile region of Decapolis, away from the influence of Jewish leaders. Narrative of Two Miraculous Healings the account of the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead is interrupted by the account of the healing of the woman with an issue of blood. By relating events in this way, Mark may have encouraged his readers to consider the two miracles together. Jairus, one of the rulers of the synagogue, would have been socially respected. The unnamed woman would have been an outcast. The two miracles together show that the Savior's compassion and power to heal are extended to all regardless of social sta standing. The ruler of the synagogue in Jesus' day, synagogues were presided over by a council of elders under the direction of a chief ruler, such as Jairus. Though he was held in high esteem by the Jews, Jairus showed great reverence to the Savior. The laying on of hands described in Mark 5.23 is the same ordinance of healing used today in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints says, And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Jesus Christ raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. This account of the healing of the daughter of Jairus is one of only three recorded instances when Jesus brought the dead back to life in anticipation of the great resurrection, when, when he will bring 
all mankind back to life. Each of these accounts allows us to see the Savior's tenderness toward those who grieve. President Howard W. Hunter analyzed the account of the healing of Jairus' daughter and pointed out several truths the account teaches us about the Savior. Nowhere else in the scriptures does this man Jairus or his name appear except on this occasion, yet his memory lives in history because of a brief contact with Jesus. Many, many lives have become memorable that otherwise would have been lost in obscurity had it not been for the touch of the Master's hand that made a significant change of thought and action and a new and better life. The tremor we hear in Jairus' voice as he speaks of my little daughter stirs our souls with sympathy as we think of this man of high position in the synagogue on his knees before the Savior. Then comes a great acknowledgment of faith. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. These are not only the words of faith of a father torn with grief, but are also a reminder to us that whatever Jesus lays his hands upon lives. If Jesus lays his hands upon a marriage, it lives. If he allows, to, if he, if he is allowed to lay his hands on the family, it lives. When they got to, to the home of the ruler of the synagogue, Jesus took the little girl by the hand and raised her from the dead. In like manner, he will lift and raise every man to a new and better life. He will permit the Savior to take him by the hand. The healing of a woman with an issue of blood. The gospel accounts do not define the exact nature of the woman's issue of blood. However, under the law of Moses, someone with an issue of blood was considered ritually unclean, meaning that the woman would have been socially ostracized and excluded from the synagogue and the temple during the twelve long years of her ailment. The dispersion she felt about her situation is suggested by the statement that she had spent all that she had seeking a cure from physicians. The Savior's question, who touched me, created the opportunity for the woman to acknowledge her act of faith and the miracle of her healing. The Savior's response helped the woman and other present avoid the misconception that the miracle had resulted from any miraculous power in his garment itself. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. It is. It also declared that the woman's neighbors and the townspeople, that she was now healed and no longer subject to the social and religious exclusions that had been imposed upon her for so many years, God's power can restore both purity and wholeness. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder Dennis B. Wander spoke about how the woman in this account acted in faith to become the to come to the Savior. Quote, Among the crowd was a woman. Outwardly, there was little to distinguish her from any other person in the crowd. No one tried to stop her from moving toward Jesus. Certainly, the apostles neither noticed her nor made any attempt to stop her. But there was something that set her apart from all others in the crowd that day. Though buried among the thronging mass, she resolutely and quietly pressed forward with a single purpose in mind to come to the Savior, having faith that he had the power to heal her, that he cared about her and would respond to her need. In this one thing, she set herself apart from the crowd. The crowd came to see, but the woman came to be healed. All of us are among the crowds of this world. Almost all of us are like the woman who, despite the crowd, comes to the Savior. We all have faith that just a touch will bring healing to our aching souls and relief to our innermost needs. In all of life's circumstances, let us quietly and resolutely press forward to the Savior, having faith that he cares about us and has the power to heal and save us. What is meant by virtue had gone out of him. Some translations of Mark 5.30, including the English King James Version and the Spanish Reina Valera Version of the Bible, state that virtue went out of Jesus Christ when the woman was healed. In the original Greek text of the New Testament, the word corresponding to virtue is dynamis, which means power or strength. Prophet Joseph Smith recorded an experience that helps us understand the virtue or spiritual strength that is required of a priesthood holder when administering to others. Well, Elder Jedediah M. Grant inquired of me the cause of my turning pale and losing strength last night while blessing children. 
I told him that I saw that Lucifer would exert his influence to destroy the children that I was blessing, and I strove with all the faith and spirit that I had to heal, to seal upon them a blessing that would secure their lives upon the earth. And so much virtue went out of me into the children that I became weak, from which I have not yet recovered. And I referred to the case of the woman touching the hem of the garment of Jesus. The virtue here referred to is the spirit of life, and a man who exercises great faith in administering to the sick, blessing little children, or confirming, is liable to become weakened. Be not afraid, only believe. One can only imagine the devastation Jarius must have felt at the unexpected declaration that his daughter was dead. Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles used Jesus Christ's comforting words to Jarius at that moment of devastation to teach the important principle that following Jesus involves choosing to keep our faith when faced with doubts or fear. Challenges, difficulties, questions, doubts, these are part of our mortality, but we are not alone. As disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have enormous spiritual reservoirs of light and truth available to us. Fear and faith cannot coexist in our hearts at the same time. In our days of difficulty, we choose the road of faith. Jesus said, Be not afraid, only believe. Them that wept and wailed greatly. When a family member died, it was a custom of the Jews of Jesus' day to mourn with loud wailing and lamentation. Wealthy or prominent families like Jairus often hired people to lament with them. At Jairus' house, it was likely a group of professional mourners who laughed scornfully at Jesus and who were asked by Jesus to leave to ensure reverence while the miraculous healing took place. The raising of the young girl was witnessed only by her mother, and father, and by Peter, James, and John. While the faith of these five individuals was rewarded, those who had laughed at Jesus forfeited the opportunity to better know him and witness his power. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. Aramaic was the language commonly spoken by the Jew Jewish people in the first century AD, and it was the language the Savior spoke. Mark recorded the actual Aramaic words the Savior spoke to the girl. Talitha is an Aramaic word meaning young girl or damsel. You may have been it and may have been a nickname applied to a young girl in a moment of tenderness. While kumi is an Aramaic word of command meaning to stand or arise. After the Savior's word, the young girl immediately arose. And the last section we'll read is Luke chapter nine. Introduction and timeline for Luke 9 through 14. The events recorded in Luke 9 through 14 represent a new stage in the Savior's ministry. He began preparing his disciples for greater responsibility, empowering and sending forth the twelve and seventy to preach and heal. In addition, Jesus Christ repeatedly emphasized vital aspects of discipleship, such as compassion, prayer, faith, repentance, sacrifice, humility, and perseverance. He also warned against hypocrisy and the, tender de and the tendency to allow temporal concerns to displace spiritual priorities. This growing emphasis on the requirements of discipleship occurred as Jesus Christ steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, where he knew he would suffer and die. As he faced this difficult aspect of his earthly mission, the Savior modeled perfect devotion to God, reinforcing his teachings on discipleship with the eloquence of his example. All right, commentary found elsewhere in this manual. Um, we're going to skip that part. Chapter 9, Herod desired to see Jesus. The, Her the Herod mentioned in Luke 9 was Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great. The word tetrarch technically means a ruler over a fourth part of the country. Antipas was a ruler over Galilee and Perea. Herod Antipas had murdered John the Baptist and was haunted by this action because he heard rumors that John, whom he knew to be a great man, had come back from the dead. He also heard rumors that Jesus could be the fulfillment of the prophesied return of Elias, Greek for Elijah. 
foretold by Malachi, when Herod Antipas heard these things, he wanted to meet Jesus. Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. After Jesus completed his mission in Galilee and knew that it was time for him to travel toward Jerusalem, he sent messengers to prepare a place for him in a Samaritan village. But because the Samaritans hated the Jews, the villagers would not let the Savior stay in their village. In these circumstances, Jesus demonstrated patience and forbearance and admonished his disciples to do the same. He taught them that they were not acting under the influence of God's Spirit. To learn more about the historical tensions, read commentary for John 4. Just as the Savior urged his disciples to exercise forbearance, President Gordon B. Hinckley asked church members to show respect for those with whom we may differ. Quote, there is so great a need for civility and mutual respect among those of differing beliefs and philosophies. We must not be partisans of any doctrine of ethnic superiority. We live in a world of diversity. We can and must be respectful toward those with with whose teachings we may not agree. We must be willing to defend the rights of others who may become the victims of bigotry. Following Jesus Christ When a certain man said that he would follow the Savior wherever he went, the Savior answered that the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, indicating that he had no home of his own. His mission was void of comforts and ease, implying that such may also be the case for those who followed him. Let the dead bury their dead. Respect. Oh, I'm going to zoom in again. Every time I change over to a different chapter, kind of zooms back out, and I apologize. Respect for parents is very important in Jewish culture, and it included the responsibility to provide a proper burial for them when they died. After preparing a body for burial and placing it in a tomb, Family members typically returned a year later to place the bones in a stone box called an ossuary, which remained in the tomb as a second burial. If the disciple was speaking of his father's secondary burial, the Savior's response would seem to communicate that now was the time for the man to serve a mission. A man could be at peace about letting his deceased father remain in the tomb with other dead members of the family. It was also possible that the Savior's response could be understood let the spiritually dead bury their physically dead. In either case, the Savior's words do not mean it is wrong to mourn the loss of a loved one or give proper respect at a funeral. Rather, these words emphasize devotion to the Lord as a disciple's highest priority. Looking back, President Howard W. Hunter explained the Savior's analogy of a man starting to plow a field and then looking back. The Savior used this analogy to teach the dangers of looking back once we have decided to follow him. To dig a straight furrow, the plowman needs to keep his eyes on a fixed point ahead of him. That keeps him on a true course. If, however, he happens to look back to see where he has been, his chances of straying are increased. The results are crooked and irregular furrows. We invite those of you who are new members to fix your attention on your new goal and never look back on your earlier problems or transgressions, except as a reminder of your growth and your worth and your blessings from God. If our energies are focused not behind us, but ahead of us on eternal life and the joy of salvation, we assuredly will obtain it. And that's the end of the reading. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.